I'll turn this over to Joe. Well, here I could. Huh? S Sally's here, by the way. Well, I can she's hear her in the background. Uh, yeah, she. You just gonna join in from the background? Yeah. Background noise. There she goes. See, she'll correct Elgin in anything he says that's wrong. <laughs> so she'll probably be talking Everything about he says. She'll have a lot of stuff to talk. About. Yeah, she'll have a lot, a lot of stuff to say tonight. I think. Uh, anyway, all right. Well, welcome to everybody. This is session three of Living the Questions. And I'm Christian Wynn, teaching minister. And uh, on my screen, at least to my left, is Joe Worden, uh, our intern who is completing his internship. Uh, and I guess in the next week or so, like I think next, next Wednesday will be your, probably your last day, and preparing to head off to seminary, Princeton Theological Seminary in the fall. Uh, so, Joe, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, my friend, and you can kind of talk a little bit about the class, introduce yourself, and all that kind of good stuff. All right. Thanks, Christian. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Joe. Um, I have seen most of you here before, and I'm sure I've ran into you in a, in a class of Christians, maybe, or a, a faith and justice at some point, but uh, if not, hello. Um, and Welcome, as Christian said, to week three of Living the Questions. Um, tonight, we are going to ask our third question, which is, where is Jesus Christ to be found? Um, just a refresher. Um, the course is structured over four weeks, and uh, it follows four questions of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's, which are, who is Jesus Christ? Um, so who is God? And where is Jesus Christ is the third question after those two. And next week we'll get to what do we, the church, do with him? Um, so I am going to pull up my screen here and hit record. Oh, Christian, I think you've got to give me permission to record. Or excuse me, not record, share screen. You should be set there. There you go. All right. And I'll just get us started here. And hit play. All right. Um, I would like to start out with a prayer. So if you would all join me and bow your heads um, and join me in prayer. Lord God. Thank you for this season of growth and warmth. Thank you for the rain that is giving us life, giving us growth and cleansing us, cleansing our earth, cleansing our streets, cleansing our bodies. We ask tonight that you give us your peace that you wash us anew again. God, that we would stand under your grace like we stand in the midst of a rainstorm. And that we would be washed together, that we would be blessed and cleaned by you and your love. And that we would see you with new eyes and hear you with new ears and love you with new hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So um, again, this is week three of Living the Questions, Exploring Basic Christianity. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, again, just a reminder, a review of last week. Um, last week, our question was, who is Jesus Christ? Um, so we talked about the identity of Christ and who he is, and sort of a couple of different ideas about how to think of Jesus Christ. Um, and in response to that question, we um, came up with the answers and discussed 
these things that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, that he is both divine and human. Um, he's the incarnation. Jesus Christ is also a person, um, which gives us a sort of concrete way or a more concrete way of thinking about him. Um, and most important of all, uh, at least for me and for this class, Jesus Christ is minister. And we also talked about what ministry means. We talked about um, the fact that God became human, uh, that the word became flesh, was an act of ministry. We talked about this idea of kenosis as it shows up in what's called the kenotic hymn in Philippians, and how it says that uh, Christ, although um, he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be held on to, but something to be shared. And so Christ or God became human to share with us the life of God, to share with us love and grace and hope and abundance and all of those things. And that, that is really our definition of ministry. Um, is this giving of yourself, giving to other people, even when it isn't necessary. So um, where that sort of left us was talking about Christ and the cross, or as I'm going to refer to it, the Christ event. So if we think about the crucifixion, um, we can think about it in terms of time, um, like historical, chronological time. And we can say that the cross, the Christ event, was a moment in time. It was event, an event in history. Um, and so what that means for us is that the cross becomes the defining event of Jesus' entire life of of god's entire existence really because if we know god through jesus then jesus becomes exemplary for god and so the cross defines jesus and the cross also becomes the center of god's life and this idea of god giving of god's self and giving up of god's own life for us becomes i think the core way to think about God and then to think about Jesus. Um, so that also means that the cross, which this is maybe an obvious statement, but I think it'll be worth unpacking it, is that the cross is actually the center of our faith, right? If we think about that, it really means that, you know, when we have these crosses around our necks or maybe tattooed on our arms, or hanging on our walls, or in our sanctuaries, in places of worship, that has meaning to it for a reason. And again, that reason is because the cross is the center, not only of Christ's life, not only of God's life, but our life as well, and our faith. And so when we're asking where Jesus Christ is, and we look to the cross, that also means that we're asking at the same time, what has Jesus Christ done there? Why is Jesus there? And again, to, to sort of bring this into a little bit more concretion, this is actually a really good way, and this will help us to understand how we can talk about um, Jesus today, not just as a person who was alive and then died and then rose again, but in between then and now, and even today in this moment, where is Jesus Christ for us? Ultimately, that's the question we're trying to answer. Where is Jesus Christ for us today? And what do we do with him once we find him? Um, and the idea that Christ rose again, um, we've kind of gotten a couple of questions bubbling up about, well, that's great, and that we know all of these things about Jesus, and who Jesus is, and 
in the Bible and who God is and what he's doing. But what does that mean for us? Where is Jesus today? Is he just up in heaven or is he actually active in the world? And I'm arguing uh, that Jesus' life after the resurrection actually continues, that Jesus' life is ongoing and that he continues to act in the world today and that those actions of Jesus are ministry. So let's get there. Um, I want to start off with maybe a little tangential uh, discussion question, but I love film and I love television. I love good film and good television. Um, so I would love to know what some of the best, maybe like one or two best movie or best television show, or uh, maybe if, if you're not a media person, a, a play or even a book um, that you've seen or read or um, gone to in, in the past um, I don't know, recently. And if you can't think of something recently, um, <laughs> that's okay. Um, yeah, so I, I would love for y'all to spit out some answers and then I'll, I'll ask the second question once we've heard back. So feel free to unmute yourself and just shout out. It's not a movie, but it's a TV series called Heartland. Awesome. What is Heartland? Heartland is a ranch in Western Canada. How about that for a setting? <laughs> it's up. It, it, it is involved with horses and training horses and saving horses and mm. a family growing up. It's been going on for 13 years. Mm. So the stars have gotten older. Interesting. It's about the only movie I've seen in the last year. And and why do you like Heartland so much, Ogden? It's just a, uh, a a sweet story about people trying to be people hmm. and failing and kind of coming back or dealing with it. I mean, it's 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 a very um, to me real kind of story real as you can get in film but and then and then it has the horse imagery which is really the, they really interact with the animals well so i like that mm. <laughs> it's it's it, it's a little soapy sure oh, okay sure well you know a little soap never hurt anybody well you know a lot of soap gets a lot of foam but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Suzanne and I are sitting here trying to remember a movie we've seen, which we haven't been in a theater in a long time. <laughs> but uh, the, the most interesting series we've seen on TV, and it isn't real recent, although I think it's coming back, is The Crown, which is a sort of a dramatized story of the British royal family. Mm -hmm. I think it basically starts back when Queen Elizabeth finds out that her father dies, she's down in Africa and she comes and then it's a, it follows the kind of the whole royal family from then basically up till now. And I mean, the, we kind of know the story, but it's uh, fictionalized, but it kind of puts meat on the bones of those characters and makes them a little more personal and less rigid and like pictures. So. It's pretty, it's a soap opera, but it's pretty interesting. That yeah. family is ripe for a soap opera though, so. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. That one has been on my, my watch list for quite a while. I haven't gotten around to it, but maybe now that you two mentioned it, I will, so. <laughs> well, there's probably, you know, three or four different seasons of it that are already on Netflix. And I think they're introducing another one pretty soon. Wow. Well, I, I guess I know what I'm going to do once I finish finals then. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, you two. Others, please. What else? Have we seen a good movie? Well, I just said that. Sorry, I said please. I've been watching media over the pandemic, but I'm embarrassed to say what how 
what junk I've been watching. So <laughs> sure. one of the better uh, programs I watched was Yellowstone, which is kind of similar to maybe what Elgin was talking about. It's a story about a family, epic story about a family who has the largest ranch um, that abuts the Yellowstone State Park and how people keep trying to come in and develop the land and take the land from them, whether it was the Indian reservation or uh, area developers because it's so valuable and just kind of a general story. And I loved it because I love that part of the country. Um, I think it's so beautiful. And um, I don't know, it, the story kind of really did a good job of developing the characters, I thought, and the characters were really well executed by the actors. So it was good. Mm. Have you been to Yellowstone? I have, but it's been a really long time and I would love to go back, but I can't talk John into doing an RV trip with me <laughs> to <laughs> Yellowstone. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. yeah. Now it's out there, John. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have we're to married, we're married RV. by the way. <laughs> oh, man. John, what about you? I haven't seen many movies lately. The one that I remember is the one about the demonstrations in Chicago during the 1968 Democratic Convention called the Chicago Seven. Wow. Yeah. I thought that was a pretty good movie. I grew up in Chicago and I was about nine or 10 years old when that happened. And I do remember a lot of it. We lived on the near west side of Chicago, and my dad, as has been said here, was a Presbyterian minister, but he was also campus minister at the University of Illinois Circle campus, and a lot of the students were going over to the north side to demonstrate and to go to Lincoln Park to be involved in those demonstrations, and coming back and telling stories about what was going on during the convention, and I remember sitting in our uh, house and watching TV with my mom. And uh, I remember seeing Dan Rather getting beat up on the floor of the Democratic Convention. I don't know if you guys remember anything about that, but it was a, it was a big deal in Chicago. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, John. I'll have to put that one in. You know, we lived in Chicago at that time too, although what was that was 60, what was that 60? 68. 68, so I was, we were almost ready to move to Minneapolis then, 68 from, so I was 28 then, uh, but that was all over the TV, particularly in Chicago, but that, that movie brought the individual characters kind of to life who tended more to get lost in the whole event. So that, that, that was a pretty remarkable movie. I think that got nominated for an Academy Award or something, didn't it? It was, it was I thought it was a really good movie. Obviously, you know, like all movies, it was kind of a drama and made certain people out to be uh, more uh, honorable than they actually were. I I, I thought there was another movie about the Black Panthers as well made, the, but I remember some of that. It was a scary time. I mean, you were, you were, how old, Jeff? I was 20, 27 at that time. Yeah, there, Chicago was in upheaval at that time. It was a mess. Where were you living? I was living out in the western suburbs, but I was working downtown. Yeah. You know, I took the train in every day at the Union Station, and then my office was over near there. So it was kind of on the other side of the loop, and I didn't really see any of what was going on, you know, over on Michigan Avenue or over on that side of the loop. Yeah. Well, my, my high school and grade school were right, you know, very close to Lincoln Park where it all happened. Mm. Mm. Thanks for sharing that, Jim. Um, yeah, I'll, mm. I'll, I should actually write that down. Um, yeah, I've, I have personally watched a lot of those types of 
movies and, and television shows in the past year, um, especially ab about um, events in um, sort of Black American history um, or, or documentaries about some of the things that um, Black people in America today go through. And they're some of the best films I've watched. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they tell stories in a, a good, a really good way. I, I saw another movie I'd like to tell you about, and that's called Hunger Ward. And Hunger Ward um, was up for an Academy Award. It's a short documentary taken in Ye Yemen, and it shows kids coming into the hospital ward uh, hungry and dying. And it didn't, and then it talks about how it didn't have to happen and how the United States doesn't even, even with a different administration, doesn't do anything to, to stop it. And they're, the, I mean, just shit, seeing the kids emaciated and coming in and, and seeing some of them die is, is just horrible knowing that it didn't have to happen. Anyway, it didn't get the Academy Award, but it was produced by a friend of ours from uh, Say No More. Oh. Oh. What was the name of that, Elgin? It, Hunger Ward. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, a short, it's a short documentary. It really is well done. Wow, I'm, I'm getting lots of movie recommendations. <laughs> this is great. Um, all right, well, unless there's anyone else, which is welcome as always. Um, I, would I, can, I can say briefly, because uh, I've seen most of these. I haven't seen Hunger Ward. That sounds really interesting. Yeah. Um, we have been uh, watching uh, basically two crime series. Um, uh, Breaking Bad. I, I never watched Breaking Bad when it first came out. Um, and so we just kind of finished watching it. It's just uh, one, it's like a meditation on sin. I think is how I would describe it. Uh, it's pretty profound, like theologically profound. Like there are these moments where, you know, it, it's uh, almost explicit in the way that it's asking the question, about the nature of bad decisions and the effects that those decisions have on people. And then we just started watching a, um, The Wire, which came out in the early 2000s and sort of was this major, like acclaimed uh, series. Um, it's in this particular, I don't know what the other seasons are gonna be like because I was reading a description of it and it talks about it's all set in Baltimore. It's, it's hyper realism. Like it's super realistic. Um, it's not tidy. Um, you just feel like you're in the, you're in a real world, but I think each season, apparently they turn the facet of your viewpoint from one institution to another is my understanding. So right now the institution is the police department. So it has a very heavy crime element but i think they do stuff on like education and maybe some other things but they kind of talk about it's sort of this meditation on like i i suppose the the necessity of institutions but also the deforming power that they can have hmm. um on human beings so anyway it's i just started it we're only like three or four episodes in and it's pretty engrossing that that show has been written up as like one of the best produced and written um, stories on TV. Wow. Yeah, I, I tried to watch it, I would say like 10 years ago. <laughs> I started watching episode one and I was just utterly lost because they literally, it's almost like they put a parachute on you, push you out the window and you land somewhere and you don't know where you are or what's going on, but there's already clearly been a bunch of stuff that's been happening and you just don't know. And so, but now that we're into episode three, 
like you can sort of start to see a little bit more of the pieces. It's it is it's really really good. So anyway, what was the first one? What was the first show? Oh, the first show was called Breaking Bad. Oh, which I'm sure you probably heard of, but it's sort of a a chemistry teacher, high school teacher, who gets cancer diagnosis and knows that he has nothing to leave his family and that he's going to bankrupt them through his cancer treatment. And he's just absolutely a brilliant chemist and he winds up cooking meth. And, and you get this really twisted, like I'm doing it for the right reason kind of thing, but it has just absolutely devastating cascading effects. Um, all the way to the end, it, it ends in season five. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's something else. It's a piece of work. Let me put it that way. <laughs> it's a piece of work. There were a couple of times when I was like, I can't do this anymore. And uh, we decided to keep with it just to see it through to the end. I think that was more satisfying, but um, it's pretty intense. Like I said, it's like a, a meditation, I think on sin, basically. It's uh -huh. power. Wow. Well, in case y'all don't believe me, here's my, I don't know how well you can see it, but here's my post-it note of shows and movies that I'm going to watch now <laughs> because of y'all. So thanks for that. Um, always looking for more stuff to watch. Um, so thank you all for sharing. Um, yeah, other than give, just giving me selfish movie recommendations, um, the reason that I wanted to ask that question is kind of because um and i i think it was john uh maybe or, or elgin that said this but um when we can like relate to characters and, and relate and imagine ourselves in the worlds and the stories that we read and watch or, or the worlds we sort of listen to um it becomes more concrete for us, right? The, the uh, like the crown, um, Queen Elizabeth isn't just this static person in, in old tiny pictures or, or just a really elderly uh, queen, a country and continent away. She is all of a sudden to us, a person with, um, with problems and with pain and with all of these things that we can maybe imagine ourselves relating to. And so she becomes more concrete to us. And the same thing is true, again, of Jesus. So, as I've said before, when we talk about Jesus, we have to talk about stories. Um, and another way to say that is that when we talk about Jesus, we have to talk about events. And if we're gonna talk about events, the fundamental and the central event or story or thing that we have to talk about is the cross. One way to think of the cross other than just um, the physical piece of wood that Christ hung on is an intersection. And I like to think of it as the intersection between God and humanity, or divinity and the world. Humanity being this line on the horizontal axis, and God intersecting and coming to us at whichever points God chooses to. Um, so even when we move along through life like this, on a straight through line, God encounters us at different points of our lives, and God is present to us in our life. And where we see that most fundamentally, again, is in Jesus, because Jesus is the incarnation, both God and human at the same time. The crucifixion is the Christ event, again, because it defines the whole of Jesus' life. So really, Jesus is at the cross. 
And that's one way of answer, answering, excuse me, our question tonight is where is Jesus to be found? Jesus is found at the cross, right? This is why in our sanctuaries, we have crosses and we face them when we pray. This is why people have crucifixes. Um, it, it's part of why people have cross necklaces and cross tattoos because there's something about being present to the cross and being at a cross that makes us feel like we are also present to Jesus. That if the cross is there, then Jesus is also there. So we go to the cross because that is where we believe Jesus is. And I would argue that we're correct. So now that y'all have had a chance to talk about y'all's favorite movies and, and TV shows, I get a chance to talk about mine. <laughs> um, so one of the best movies I've ever seen is called Arrival. And I can't remember exactly when it was made. I, I'm pretty sure it was the last five or so years. Um, but the sort of gist of the movie is that um, this uh, linguist or linguistics doctor, she's a professor and a professional in her field, Dr. Louise Banks. She wakes up one morning and goes into her normal job and none of her students are in her morning class. She's in a lecture hall of about, I want to say two or three hundred and nobody is at her class. And so she, um, she asks the few people that are there, like, where is everybody? And they say, have you seen the news? So she turns on the news and it turns out that there are these things called that, um, that are landing all over different places in the world. They just showed up somewhere and literally dropped down from the sky. Um, and so she, for some reason, is called in by the U.S. military to try and help figure out a message that these things are saying, which is what you see in that picture there, is her standing before whatever creatures are in these heptapods writing something to her, trying to communicate with her. Um, and so the movie's called Arrival because it is about the arrival of these alien creatures into the world. So to bring it back to the cross, um, again, the crucifixion is the event that defines all of the rest of Jesus' life, um, meaning both before and after. So the rest doesn't just mean that the cross is like this changing point and that after the cross, Jesus is obviously different. He is not humanly alive anymore but he is um he ascends and is active in the world as a spirit that is true but it's also true that the cross because it is so powerful because it has this sort of weight to it 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 changes all of time around it which is a little bit of a heady concept but bear with me here and we'll get through it so to say that the cross is the center of Christ's life is to say that it transforms all of Jesus' life before and after from life to death or resurrection or ascension, however you want to think about that. There's almost this ripple effect. If you can imagine dropping um, a stone in a pond, um, the ripples don't just go out in one direction. They move out in all directions. And that's um, akin to how the cross functions in time. It changes everything around it. It actually becomes the center of all time and all space, which is, again, why part of why, um, maybe unconsciously, but part of why we think it's so important. 
So what does it mean that Jesus is then at the cross? If, if that is where Jesus is found, then why is he there? And part of this is to return to the question of who Jesus is. Uh, Michael J. Gorman, who is a biblical scholar and theologian, he's written a lot um, on this idea of cruciformity, and he really focuses on, on Paul's letters. Um, but he has this book, I have it somewhere. He has this book called Inhabiting the Cruciform God. And the word cruciform for him means two things. One, it's a reference to the crucifixion, um, which is the cruci half of the word. And two, um, the part form means in the shape of. So this word cruciform is kind of this idea of being in the shape of the cross or, or being in the shape of Christ who is on the cross or Christ who is at the cross. Um, so, so really what this means is that it's this idea of the cross forming and shaping both Jesus's action and his identity all of who he is. Are there any questions at this point? I just want to pause and remind everybody that if you have a question or a comment, um, feel free to unmute yourself and, and stop me at any point, truly do. I have a question. So what do, what do you mean, did I hear you right that you said Christ at the cross is center of all time and space? Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, is, what does that mean? I don't know that there's a way to fully answer that question until we get to maybe, I want to say, seven or eight slides ahead of where we are now. Um, I'll, I'll expound upon it right now. Um, trying to think of how to answer that maybe. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's a way to, for me to answer that, John, without skipping ahead seven slides, but um, is, a, is that all right if we hold on to that? And I. Yeah, it, just, it seemed like a pretty profound statement. And so I just was wondering what that meant. Yeah, um, I guess I'll, I'll try to foreshadow it a little bit. Um, I'm saying that is kind of a metaphysical kind of statement um, that if it basically the idea that if we believe that Jesus Christ has transformed all of creation and all people and everything, well, that kind of has to include like space and time in maybe a more scientific metaphysical way right? So it, it's really, I think, for me, it's just another way of saying um, that the cross is so important to our lives. Um, like, like we say that Christ is the center of our lives, and we want to be centered on Christ, at least at, at Bethel, because we're so evangelical. I hear that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of the same idea, just on a metaphysical level. Does that maybe clear things up a little bit yeah a little bit i just was i was wondering if you if if the crucifixion is where time and space changes or is it the resurrection mm. could it be both could the the resurrection actually be um part of the crucifixion if that makes sense I think, I mean, yeah, it definitely is part of the uh, the resurrection is, but it seems to me that when, when Jesus is resurrected and is brought back to life, that that is the crucial point of Christianity. Mm. Yeah. And if he wasn't, if he wasn't resurrected, then I don't know if there would be any cr Christianity. Yeah. Preach yeah. it, John. 
<laughs> yeah, I. No, I, I, I. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, please interrupt me, Elgin. Well, I thought you were going to answer, John. I've interrupted. <clears throat> Um, okay. yeah, well, all I was going to say was that um, part of, I think it's important that we have to hold the resurrection and the crucifixion together and that we can't focus. I mean, obviously we can't have just one. We have to have both. Um, I, I'm very Lutheran, which is uh, Christian actually kind of um, not revealed that to me, but um, helped me realize that. Um, the last time I taught this course. Um, but really, I think the cross is so central because the cross is sort of symbolic that, that because God in Christ dies and in a sense goes, like enters death, um, that is the one point where humanity before the cross could have been separated from God. And the fact that God goes to the one place that, um, that God couldn't have gone before, um, I think that's very profound. And obviously God is resurrected again, Christ rises. Um, but I think that is the, the point of the cross, that um, it's the deepest part, um, in a sense, and there is no, there is after the, the cross, because of the cross, there is now no longer any place that we can go to be separated from God. Um, like in Romans, um, we believe that neither angels nor demons nor any other things will separate us from the love of God. Um, sort of that idea. But you're right, John, we do have to hold them in tension. And part of that is when we'll talk about ministry and what we do, what do we do after? What do we do because of the resurrection? So, Elgin, did you still have a, a question or a comment? Yeah, yeah, and and I don't mean to be be challenging it in in any way, but we were talking today at, at lunch um, about the idea of scientific theory and religious theory is, is is Jesus on the cross now is that a theory or is that a fact or if if it says in in the bible this will happen is that a theory I'm, i've never questioned the bible that way and i probably shouldn't but i did I think you should. I, I think that's the heart of it, brother. Um, yeah, well, I kind of hear two questions almost, and I'm just for the sake of time, unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to go to the first one, which is, you know, what does it mean that Jesus is on the cross? Um, so in a historical sense, right, let's say that we all went back in time to the day that Jesus actually was physically on the cross. I think then we could say, yeah, that is a literal fact, right? But since we're not there today, and we can't time travel, unfortunately, um, really when I use it to mean, like we find Jesus today on the cross, part of what that means for me is that, again, the cross is sort of representative of like human suffering and death. It's the place, again, the place that, um, it, it's kind of like the entrance to, or, or the location of even death and human suffering, which we thought separated us from God, but now doesn't because now guess who is there? Guess who is on the cross? Guess who can be found in suffering and in death? God in Christ. So really, um, it, it's more of poetic language or metaphorical language. Um, and also in scripture, a lot of times those, I, I tend to think at least that um, a lot of the 
later eschatological writings were more poetic than they were like factual in a, a scientific sense. Um, but that's just one way to look at it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of the cross again, I think I pretty much covered this. Um, the only thing that I want to reiterate is that the cross shapes both Jesus' action and identity. So it, because of the cross, Jesus is thought of as um, the one, the person who is crucified, the crucified one, as in the crucified person. But it also shapes, I think, Jesus' action, which um, by action, I mean, if Jesus is risen and active in the world today and not just sitting up in heaven hanging out having a good time then well that means that christ is acting in the world today and that we're we are looking for him and i think there's something about again the weight of the cross that shapes his action and maybe that is that um because the cross is this entrance into suffering maybe that means that Jesus' action today is entering into people's suffering. And that's part of where we can find him. And that means then that identity and action are bound together. You can't have one without the other, uh, which is why we're talking about where Christ is when we talked about who he is last week. If we had just stopped at who God is and who Christ is, and left it at that, that would have been great. But what does that actually mean for us if, if God isn't here? You know, it, it's great if God is a loving person, Jesus is a loving person who is a minister. But if Jesus doesn't act, act and actually love me, then how is that important to me? And that brings us to the ministry and the action of Jesus on the cross. So again, where is Jesus Christ? He's on the cross. Um, and to go back to Gorman's word, Christ is crucified. And why is Jesus there? Jesus is there to minister to the world. Jesus died on the cross. We know this. Christ died on the cross for our sake so that our sins can be forgiven. At least that's, that's one way of saying, it, right? Um, and so the way that we're going to think about that in this class is that really that is an act of ministry. And remember, ministry is this idea of giving or giving up or giving of oneself. Um, and so... The reason that I say that the cross is central to Jesus is because it's like the core and most poignant and fundamental and just weighty act of ministry that God does. God actually gives God's own life up. God becomes human so much so that God dies a death on a cross for our sake. God gives God's life up. Jesus gives his body up, literally, and says, take and eat. Um, he, and he does that for our sake, for the sake of the world. And that is what ministry is. The crucifixion then, the Christ event, is ministerial, which means that because the cross is an event of ministry or an act of ministry, it testifies to the fact and witnesses to the fact that God is fundamentally a minister, that God is the one who gives of God's self. And that whenever we think of God, whenever we think of Jesus, we have to think about God as minister. God is one who gives us grace when we don't deserve us, who gives us love even when we think ourselves in love with that is ministry. And the, that act of ministry on the part of Christ 
is one faithful obedience, which we talked about faith last week is this idea of uh, the faithfulness of Christ to both us and to God, the father. Um, and it's also something that is salvation, right? Again, that is part of why I think we have crucifixes everywhere as Christians. I mean, if I look over to my shelf with all of my theology and Bible books, like I want to say at least a third of them have like a little tiny cross on the side somewhere. We as Christians are obsessed with the cross and rightly so because it is such a central event to us. It's so important for a reason. We find our salvation there. This is just kind of a depiction of um, Jesus going to the cross from left to right, that Jesus goes to the cross. The result of that is an act of ministry. And, and so we have to hold these three things together again. All right. So we've thrown around this word ministry a lot, and I've tried to give it um, definition throughout. But I want to hear, um, regardless of whether or not you, you know, think of ministry the exact same way that I do, what is something that you would call ministry that you've experienced? Um, somebody who has ministered to you or, or maybe um, an act of ministry that you have done for others. Um, feel free to unmute yourselves or, or take time if you need to. This is more of a uh, personal and weighty question. I, I, I think that the church ministers uh, to me, and I think that all the ministers from Colonial Church have ministered to me and being part of my spiritual growth, going to Christians' classes, going to service on Sunday morning, all those experiences for me have increased my faith, made me have a better understanding of who Jesus is, the church has also given me opportunities to do things such as uh, participate in loaves and uh, fishes and other types of activities where you serve people. So all those things, I think, are very important. So I think the church as a whole is, is a ministry that serves and it allows you to serve in it as well. Yeah. That's, I love what you said there, John, that the church really is a ministry. Um, I, I, really, that's like my ecclesiology, my theology of the church summed up in a sentence. Um, so I totally agree. I love what you said. Um, yeah, but right, like this idea that um, the church, that we all are ministers, it, it brings us back to the priesthood of all believers. It, is this idea that like we're not just people that gather in a building, but we're actually doing things and also that we're a part of something um, and that we do this not for ourselves, but for other people and that ministry is for the world. I think that's a really beautiful concept. Um, and, and of course we're not perfect at that, but um, that's not necessarily the point either. So. Yeah, thanks, thanks, John. Others? Um, I would like to just remember um, in 1996, when we began the Stephen ministry, which was a whole system of training people to learn how to listen, to care, to console, not advise, but just walk with people who are going through difficult times in their life. And we I can't even tell you how many people we trained I can tell you that the training was so profound and then the experience of walking with people, not to advise, not to solve, not to cure, but to love and to care and to encourage and just, just be there as people were walking through various experiences of their life. And it went for 25 years. 
and there were many, many people trained as Stephen ministers, and there were, and there were so many people. There were hundreds of people, really, who were served and loved, and um, just carried through difficult times in their life. I can't, I can't think of anything more precious than that in my faith walk, to have been a part of that and to have experienced wonderful people and their life story and walking with them. And so um, that's a very precious time to me. And I think it's to those who have been a part of it too. So both as a Stephen minister and to have been ministered to. So that's all. Yeah. It, Suzanne, did that, did that kind of um, stop at the church or is it sort of ongoing or did it morph and get become part of the deacons? It stopped Monday night, Christian. <laughs> we officially closed it down Monday night. Seriously? Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. We had a little goodbye event and that was it. It's kind of, it, it trickled down the past couple of years. A lot of reasons for that. Uh, but it's now over. If it's been absorbed, it's been absorbed by the deacons, but I don't think in the same way. Mm -hmm. Because that, that kind of ministry has showed up at other churches. Oh, it's, it's well, everywhere. It's still going strong, it's lots everywhere. of places. It's, it's just not going strong at Colonial. Well, and the thing about it that's so wonderful is that if people, people would like to be a Stephen minister, there is a very deep and fabulous training program that they go through of faith and learning to pray and to walk with someone. So, I mean, it ministers to those that are suffering. It ministers to those who are learning to walk with people. So it's been a wonderful thing. And I'm sure, you know, once a Stephen minister, always a Stephen minister, you just carry it on in your life. So anyway, it has been a part of Colonial Church, but no longer. <clears throat> or at least for not for right now. Well, until it gets re resurrected. <laughs> Not till we get some of that resurrection, Joe. <laughs> well, that yeah, that um, Suzanne. That reminds me that my uh, my my dad was actually a Stevens minister. I want to say either in his late twenties or early thirties. Um, yeah, and he, I know that he hasn't told me much about it but I know that he while he was in it he he loved it he was very committed to it and would probably say a lot of the same things that you just shared um so yeah thank you for that what else where else have we been a part of ministry or been ministered to or seen others maybe even ministering to each other I can share a couple of examples. Um, I'll sh one of them is from the very, sort of the very beginning of my Christian walk. And then the other is um, like last year. And I would say in both cases, I, I received ministry. Like, I think I was like present to maybe do some ministering but it was primarily that i received something so the one that just sticks in my mind it was probably 30 years ago <clears throat> um i became a christian as a sophomore in college part of that was because of the ministry of intervarsity but part of it was also because i joined a basically a church that's that was like right on the edge of um, the inner city of Greensboro, North Carolina, because I was at, uh, in college. And um, they had a very strong presence and ministry to <laughs> the homeless or the home, the kind of home challenged, people who had um, addiction issues. We had people who would worship with us on Sundays who were about as drunk as you could possibly believe they smelled like you wouldn't believe but they were there they were with us they were in service with us 
So what I remember is the event that I particularly remember was going to the soup kitchen that the church um, had an intimate part. Either they either started it or they had an intimate partnership with it. I don't know. And, um, and I was there as like one of these, you know, bright eyed college students who was going to help serve soup or whatever. And before we started the meal, I remember the minister, kind of the liaison pastor, I think his name was Steve. He called on this guy named Moses, who was a probably 55 year old African American man who had himself clearly had a very difficult life and might have even at that time sort of been someone who lived at the shelter. Um, he asked him to bless the meal by opening with a song. And he sang the song like, I still remember how powerful it was Um, it was, uh, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And it was just this like deep baritone African-American man, just the soul and the suffering and the faith and the life was just so present. And I, I felt transported to the cross. Um, it was, I'll never forget it. And uh, so that was, that was one, as you can see, it's like, that was buried deep down inside of me. Um, the other was, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with um, Stephanie Spencer. She goes by Steph and she leads uh, the 40 Orchards ministry. And they do these Bible studies at our church. And um it's based on like a Jewish midrash approach and they, they'll meet together for about a couple hours. And uh, I was fascinated from the first time I was present in one of her um, sessions, because the reason I got into theology was that I remember reading an article by Karl Barth where he was interpreting a passage in first Kings and at the end of it, I was like, how did he do that? <laughs> like, how did he understand that? Like, how did he bring that message out? So I was, I was always, I've always been like fascinated with scripture. And so I've sat in on a couple of her classes and they're just so powerful. And I'm supposed to be there as a ministerial presence or whatever, but truthfully, like I receive so much and it's not, and it's not, it's Steph, Steph is obviously she's leading it, but She's so good at facilitating. And what happens is that everyone in the group winds up ministering to everybody else. Uh, and so it's like this kind of cross giving and receiving, and it's just extraordinarily powerful. So anyway, those are just two examples I can think of. I'd like to put in a plug here for something that's been very important to me, which is Young Life. And Elgin and Sally Mannard have a, have a role in this because in 1974, when we moved to Minneapolis, they were already involved in Young Life and they got us involved. And uh, we have been involved ever since in Young Life. That's only 47 years. So maybe it's not very permanent, but uh, <laughs> the, the key to Young Life, if you don't know it, is a guy named Jim Rayburn who founded Young Life was a church outreach minister in 1941 and he decided that the church needed to go where the kids were not sit in the church buildings and wait for the kids to come so they moved that ministry into schools and into the streets uh, to reach kids there and it continues to grow to this day mm -hmm. to where it reaches now it's around the world in 150 countries or something in addition to the U.S. And the outreach and the impact of it is just incredible. So it's, it's a fun thing to be. It's a very, I said, I've always said, Young Life is 110% on serious gospel message and 110% on fun. 
because Young Life really uh, excels in right fun. I've got a Young Life mug right here with all my, my whiteboard markers in it. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Thank you all for sharing. Um, I truly, this being the second time I've taught it, and it, this was true last time as well, but this question and, and the discussions we have is truly my favorite part about, quite honestly, the time I've spent at Colonial, um, hearing about just these beautiful and, and life-changing events that like we we all have and we can all share in and, and there's really something I think enriching and at least for me encouraging that this is one of those things for me that whenever I, I remind myself like man why am I studying the Bible why did I get a degree in ministry what job is that going to get me seriously um wh whenever i i have those sort of questions this is one of the things that reminds me like i can't do anything else that, that there's something that i'm pulled into something and I'm, I'm pulled into y'all's stories and, and feel human connection and feel the presence of christ here and I, I think that this in and of itself is ministry, that we're ministering to each other. Um, so truly thank you for, for sharing. Um, so I, I would be remiss if I didn't add another Dietrich Bonhoeffer quote in here somewhere. And um, the point really that I'm trying to make with all of this is that we always look to the cross always that that is where we find jesus and we never have to look beyond it because when we look to the cross and we find jesus we encounter jesus we are taken into experiences of suffering maybe with each other as we tell each other our own experiences and stories of pain or maybe with a neighbor or with somebody we don't know. But when we look to the cross and when we enter that space of suffering and pain and depth together, something about it transforms us and something about us about it gives us new life. And that's where the resurrection comes in. The way Bonhoeffer thought about the cross and Christ was that when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And it's not as um, maybe depressing as it sounds, because again, we believe that in death there is life and that death is not a barrier anymore between us and God. Um, and so there's almost a kind of hope that we can embrace that in a way and have faith that even though we may die, even though we may metaphorically enter experiences of death, experiences of suffering, there is still a God who will and does meet us precisely there. And I think what that means for us today is that to be the church means to be called into ministry. It means to enter the lives of others, especially the lives of those who are oppressed and persecuted. And it means to share and listen to them, um, maybe like a Stevens minister might, just to listen just to hold space with them, just to share a meal or share a moment 
or a conversation or a cup of coffee with them, to pray with them, and to wait for God to show up. That's what it means to be the church. And so we are, in a sense, pulled toward ministry as the church. So what is the church? Um, a distinction that I think needs to be made is that there are two ways of thinking about the church or two sides of the church. One is the lower C church, and it's the institutional church. Think man-made, think structures and buildings and the institutional side of things and the, the practices we all do and the traditional side of it. Um, and then there is the, the capital C church, the real body of Christ in the world. Uh, this is what we mean when we say that the church is universal and that the body of Christ is universal. It means that we as Christians participate in the church. We are in, quite literally, Christ, in, in again, a metaphorical sense. Um, and this doesn't mean that the institutional church is less important. It still is. Um, we have to have institutions. I think that's why the, uh, the wire that Christian brought up as a TV show is interesting, talking about the necessity of institutions, because they make things concrete to us. We, we have to have institutions because they're practical and, and concrete. But what's more important is the actual presence of Christ that allows us to gather, that allows us to love each other and serve each other, to preach the gospel, to share peace, to share love, to do good in the world. That is what creates the institutional church. So both are real, but the reason the church exists is because of Christ. Hey, Joe, I think, uh, I think John has a question. Go ahead, John. Can you, can you explain a little bit about the Protestant view of the Eucharist and what is the thought about uh, the Eucharist being, you know, making, you know, entering Christ into you? Yeah. Um, I don't, j just as a preface, I don't know how much I'll be able to dive into that because we've only got about 13 or so minutes left. Um, how about this? I, I won't and can't speak on behalf of all Protestants, but I'll try to uh, speak on behalf of myself um, as somebody who grew up in the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Um, the way that I understand the Eucharist is, I mean, I think there are multiple ways to think about it. I mean, on the one hand, it's again, metaphorically or symbolically, Christ giving himself to me, literally. It's his body and blood. And obviously it's, you know, bread and wine or wafer and grape juice or, you know, whatever. Um, but symbols have power. And so um, sort of a way to think about it maybe is that by putting Christ's body and blood into me, I'm, I'm not like cannibalistically eating Christ so much as I am, like it's an intimate act. Like it's my joining. It, it's more of, I think, my joining with Christ, not my um, like taking in of Christ and now Christ is inside of me and I have him and you can't have him because he's in here. Like it's more about intimacy, I think. It's more about connection and also the idea that Christ's spirit is in me, that Christ in a sense knows me better than I know myself, that Christ's spirit has union with my spirit um, and that that is part of the Christian life. Um, so I, mean, there are, I, I actually think that there are a plethora of ways to think about it and that there 
really isn't a single correct way to think about the Eucharist, but it's kind of a dynamic thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, great question. Um, thanks for letting me nerd out on my Protestantism. Um, okay, so I'm going to keep us moving just so we get through the rest of this. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. Okay, so again, the institutional church is important, but the body of Christ, um, which is, yes, this abstract thing, but it's the, how do I want to say this? Um, the big C church is what makes the little C church possible, if that makes sense. And hopefully that'll become more clear. But um, really what this means for us in ministry is that we as the church, so we as Colonial Church of Edina, um, become more than just an institution. We actually participate in the body of Christ. And so we represent Christ to the world when we participate in ministry. So when we minister to other people, it's not just that we're a group of people that gather Sunday nights and go, um, I don't know, maybe go volunteer at a food shelter. It, it's more than that. It is, we believe quite literally that we are doing the work of Christ, that we are participating in Christ's action. And another way to say that is that we are participating in ministry. So another way to think about this um, this is just a side tangent, a picture of a black hole from 2019, which the if you haven't read articles about this, you should, because the concept of seeing something that you can't actually see because it's a black hole is just fascinating. Um, but unfortunately, we have to kind of skip ahead. Um, so, um, Interstellar is this space movie that if you haven't seen it, again, please go watch it. Um, but the reason I bring up black holes is that black holes have gravitational poles. And so it's kind of uh, a useful way for us to think about the cross as sort of um, similar to a black hole in function because the cross has this gravity that pulls us nearer to it it's, it's similar to how Christ calls us to the cross. And so we get pulled toward the cross. Um, it's similar to how if you were in a space and you got in space and you got close enough to the black hole, you would um, get sucked into the black hole. Um, and so hopefully this whiteboard depiction makes a little bit of sense, but in chronological time, you have the cross moving from left to right. And again, because the cross is so transformational, because it has this sort of gravitas to it, um, it doesn't just affect things in a straight line afterwards. It actually affects all the space and all of time. Um, and this is to answer, I think, was it John or Elgin that asked what, uh, what does that mean that the cross transforms all of space and time? This is what I'm getting at, is that it's so transformative that it, it moves beyond the laws of chronological time and it transforms all of creation. Um, and that, again, because the cross is an event of ministry, that that spills out into the world and that... Um, acts of ministry happen because of that. So we as people, if we think about that blue dot or blue circle as um, the ministry of Christ on the cross, when we go to the cross, we participate and we find Christ and we participate in what Christ is doing. We become shaped and formed like Christ. So Another way to say that maybe is that as Christ was able to suffer with and for others, 
so now we too are able to suffer and share suffering and pain with and for others. We are able to bear the cross. And what happens when we do that is that we come together in the center and, and something happens that is transformative because from there, we go back out into the world and we minister to other people. Um, when I, I can't think of an example, but when I, um, I mean, think of yourselves and some of the stories that you have shared tonight. When you were ministered to, it, it wasn't just one event that you said, oh, that was beautiful and I'm just going to move on with my life. You felt a part of something. You felt pulled into something. And so you had to do something about it. You had to join what was going on. And so you didn't just receive ministry. You didn't just stand back and watch. You actually participated in it. You partook. You then became ministers. And you ministered to those around you because of somebody else ministering to you because of Christ ministering to us. And this means that to encounter Christ, to find Jesus Christ, is actually to be pulled into events of ministry. More concretely, that means that when we minister to other people, that when I take a phone call from somebody I haven't talked to in, in a year and a half, and they tell me that they had this spiritual experience and that they can, they can appreciate the work of Christ and they can worship like they never have before. It means that when I listen and I share that space with them, that I'm ministering to them. And because that is an event of ministry that both of us share, it's not just him and I alone as two persons. Somehow, Christ is also there sharing that space with us. We encounter Christ in ministry to others, which means we encounter Christ in the world. So where do we go from here? Again, this picture represents kind of what I call the Nova effect. Um, and I, I might have said this before, but what this all means for us, the church, on a more communal level, is that we, the church, are born in ministry again and again, like a continual baptism, that when we minister to other people, that we actually have to do that again and again and again, because if we don't do that, we're not being the church that if we're not participating in the transformation and liberation of the world, we're not existing as the church. And that's transformation from death and for life, again, for ministry. We only are the church when we are ministering to other people. We live in that sense, in ministry because Christ calls us to be ministers to the world with him. So what is ministry? Ministry is the event of encountering Jesus Christ with another person. If you think to your examples of, of events of ministry that you gave, or maybe you didn't get to share them, almost always they're with other people. And even if it's a single experience, again, there's something about it that's transformational that means you have to go share it. You have to go tell people. You can't keep the gospel to yourself. And so you have to share it with another person. But ministry is always personal. It is always shared between persons. It always happens between persons. And that, I think, is the way finally we've got a little concretion that we can actually talk about the presence of Jesus and what ministry is for us today, really concretely. 
is we get to talk about relationships. We get to talk about people that we meet in the church or on the street or in school or at work or wherever. That that becomes the language we get to use to talk about Christ and where we find him, who he is, and what we do once we find him. And again, we minister to others then by being with them, by encountering who they are, where they are at, by entering a relationship with them, even if that relationship is just sitting down with someone for coffee for an hour once, and you never talk to someone again. I have done that, and those have been some of the most transformational events in my own life people that I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm friends with now, but who I know I was in ministry with, that we shared something more than just coffee, that we shared the presence of Christ with each other. And as we encounter other people and we share space together in space and time, that becomes an event of ministry. That becomes something that transforms both of us and that is our experience of Jesus Christ. So, before I close, um, I want to ask if there are any questions or clarification that I can answer. Um, we covered a lot of heavy stuff tonight, and I want to make sure that we're going into next week, we're clear on where we're at. I think Jeff, Jeff's got his hand up. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. You know, Colonial used to have kind of a motto. I don't think we use it as much anymore, but it's still very relevant that the, the purpose of Colonial Church is to grow in Christ and serve the world. And that's a pretty good two-pronged thing of a, a way of what you're talking about. We need to take in Christ's message to ourselves, but then we need to serve the world with that message. So, uh that theme in other ways kind of resonates, I think, through a lot of places. Yeah, no, that's that's a, a perfect way um, to say what I've been saying. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Any others? Uh, it looks like uh, Therese, you have your um, ears unmuted. Did you want to make a comment or question? No. Nope. Okay. Just checking in. Okay, well, if not, um, I'll do this so I can see all of you again one last time. Um, so this is wonderful. Um, next week, we're going to talk more practically and pragmatically about what then do we as Colonial Church do? Um, and also what the broader church we can do. Um, but really, next week is when we get to talk about, well, then what do like where do we go like what where can we minister what, maybe where are there needs that we can meet what can we actually do um so in preparation for that bring your ideas bring your thoughts bring your examples it's going to be much more discussion based and much less of me um lecturing at you which i'm very excited for, to hear of y'all hear y'all's thoughts um so bring your thoughts bring your ideas Bring your person as always. Um, yeah, that's where we're going. This is where we have gotten so far. Um, thank you all for being here. I'll close us in prayer if you would bow your heads with me. God of grace and giver of life, we celebrate you tonight and all of the ministry that you have done through, with, and for us, the various ways that we have experienced and seen and felt you in our lives, God, and that we can share that with each other. And most importantly, that we can share that with the world. God, we thank you that you are an active and a living God, that when we seek you, we are able to find you and that there is no place that we can go. That there is nothing 
neither angels nor demons, nor powers, nor things to come that will separate us from your love. In Jesus' name, amen.